Oblivious of the seriousness of Jeanne's illness and completely preoccupied with discrediting Liebig, he at last experienced success. A flask containing no albumen or organic material to break down had become cloudy, showing that the yeast had multiplied exactly as he'd hoped they would. The chemical theory of fermentation was disposed of at last. Now, with a young assistant and a larger laboratory, Pasteur was determined to inquire more deeply into this new order of life. Where did these minute creatures come from? If they could find their way so easily into so many substances, the obvious place to look first was the air. So he and his assistant set up a pump to draw air through the window and trap everything it contained on a wad of gun cotton. The gun cotton would then be dissolved in alcohol and the resulting suspension examined under the microscope. Pasteur was already aware that many other scientists preferred to believe that germs appeared spontaneously, synthesized out of decaying organic matter. This completely undermined Pasteur's belief that germs could one day be controlled. What he saw under his microscope confirmed that they did indeed come from the air. In every sample there were hundreds of organized living bodies. Here were the organisms that, like his yeasts, could transform whatever they fed upon. He was about to demolish yet another of the old guard's bastions. I understand he's trying to discredit the doctrine of spontaneous generation. It's a maze he'll never find his way out of. Well, Louis says it's essential that people realize that the lice they see crawling on bad meat have not been spawned by the meat itself, but by other lice. But every scientist knows that nowadays. Well, perhaps. But with these almost invisible creatures that Louis has been finding, it's difficult to convince people that these organisms don't just spring into being by themselves, by chance. That's the doctrine that he can't believe. And there you are. We boil up a broth of organic matter in the flask till the heat has destroyed everything living that it contains. So it's completely sterile. But the vapor from the boiling does not only sterilize the interior walls, it also forces out the air. Now, if we remove the flame from the flask and allow the liquid to cool, the vapor condenses and is replaced by air that will come right through from the red-hot tube where everything contained in it will have been burned. And when the flask is cold, we cut it off from the rest of the apparatus here and seal it again. So, we're left with the flask containing air. But air robbed of everything living in it. Will it spontaneously give rise to organisms now? Of course not. That will remain pure for years. I know, I know, but Louis, it's all been done before. And now Pouchy and the others have come up with a new objection. What new objection? When you heat the air, you say you have killed the germs. They say you have killed the life force. It was seemingly impossible. But how could he devise a way of robbing the air of germs and then allowing it into contact with the broth without interfering with it in any way. Always resourceful, he created, with the help of a colleague and a glass blower, a novel and ingenious form of flask, its neck drawn out like a swan's. Boil an infusion in that until the germs are killed and the air driven out. Then leave it to cool. No heating this time of the air that has got into it. We don't even need to seal the entrance. Yet, ladies and gentlemen, that flask will remain pure for years. How do you explain that, you partisans of spontaneous generation? Yeah. Organic matter exposed to ordinary unheated air. Will you say that by boiling the infusion, I have destroyed some mysterious genetic power? If so, let me cut the neck of the flask. There. Now, ladies and gentlemen, 
I can assure you that in two days' time, that liquid will be cloudy. Will you now say that the genetic power has simply been waiting for the swan next removal to manifest itself? <laughs> no. The truth is that before I broke the neck of the flask, the dust from the air was trapped in the curve of the neck here. Remove the curved neck, and you have removed the trap, and the dust now has a clear passage down into the liquid. As a further proof, I'll take another flask containing a similar infusion and shake it so that the liquid now makes contact with the trapped dust, and it too will begin to alter. For if only one tiny organism makes contact with the liquid it needs to feed on, it will multiply rapidly and thus cloud the liquid. <laughs>